let's review how we might find some of the final requested items in the handout. So the fundamental vibrational frequency can be determined by doing a sum of transitions. The way this is going to work is if you take the R0 plus the P1. So let's think of the R0 transition as this one, and then the P1 as this one. So do you see how the average of these transitions is almost, it's like, well, within the non-rigidity and the inharmonicity issue would be equal to the fundamental vibrational frequency, which is this quantity here. So the fundamental frequency, it's that zero to zero transition, not directly observable. But one of the ways we might get at that is to take the R0 transition, add the P1 transition to it in energy. So this should be about 6,000 wave numbers. So this should be a pretty big number. We've done a lot of differences. I'm just really trying to highlight we're adding them together here. And then the R0 transition, one of the ways we can say, or define the R0 transition, is it's equal to the fundamental, but then it has this difference of energy additional. Um, it says to ignore D0 and D1. So this difference of energy here is just equal to two times B1. So the R0, would be equal to the fundamental frequency plus two times B1. And then the P1 would be equal to the fundamental frequency, but then it's missing this difference of energy, which is two times B0. Okay, so you can take the two transitions, add them together, and see that they're equal to two times the fundamental plus two B1 minus two B0. We know B1 and B0 already, or hopefully at this point you've gone through and determined their numerical values. So you can enter those and solve directly for the fundamental frequency. So one equation, one unknown, no need for a system of equation to solve for the fundamental frequency. And then you may just do it again. It says to um, average you know, across all available lines. So what we might do is say, okay, let's do the R1 and then plus the P2. So let's do the analysis again. So if we're looking at the R1, let's do red. So the R1 starts in one, goes up to two, and then the P2 starts in two, ends in one. And then just use those relative to the blue transition for the fundamental. Okay, so the R1 would be equal to, what am I doing? I'm just trying to change the color. R1 transition would be equal to the fundamental, fundamental frequency, that's the new with the tilde. Fundamental frequency, and it's this difference of energy now, so it's like the two minus the zero, so that's going to be six B1 higher than the fundamental frequency goes, and then it's missing two times B zero, because it started off in the one. So it's missing the J one, the J zero, and V equals zero, which is two times B zero. And then the P one starts in two, excuse me, the uh, P two starts in two, ends in one. So the P two transition would be equal to the fundamental, and it ends two B one higher, and it started out six B zero higher. So it's missing that six times B zero on the fundamental frequency. Okay, and so um, you can try to work out how perhaps, um, you know, how you go from two to eight to think of where you go next. You can use Excel to try to figure out these numbers or you can just do them by hand, just uh, a couple of transitions. And so the idea here is your fundamental frequencies and really, really the reason why, I say all, if you do at least the first three Determination. So if you at least go through R2 plus the P3, I'm happy. Because the key is seeing that they come out to be the same frequencies to almost six decimal places. I mean, you're talking probably agreement to at least five decimal places. And if you're making a mistake on your arithmetic here, or your calculation, you may see that there's some variation in the ones place holder. Like, because it's like, it works out to be, I don't know, 2886.xx. And you see really good precision here if you do the calculations correctly. And you'll notice a mistake if you're doing them incorrectly. But if you only do it once, you may easily not miss or not catch the mistake.
So the equation 16 was the connection between BE and alpha E. That was the equation that B sub E is equal to BE minus alpha E um, uh, alpha E. It's, um, sorry, <laughs> blanking on the equation. So the, uh, it's alpha E V plus a half. Okay, and so if you have an equation you can write out for B0, an equation you can write out for B1, where B0 would be BE minus a half alpha E, and then B1 would be equal to BE minus three halves alpha E, then you have yourself a system of equations that you can solve for BE and alpha E. So two equations, two unknowns. You can solve for those accordingly. You can you know, play around with that system of equation solver to make the arithmetic a little easier if you need to, or if you wish to. And then from the fundamental vibrational frequency, determine the force constant. So the way I would do this, take your frequency in wave numbers to a frequency in inverse seconds. And then from there, use the uh, relationship between the fundamental frequency and the force constant and reduce mass. Now we can analyze the overtone band. Now the overtone band Shown here where we have the direct absorbances from J0 to J1, J1 to 2, that's the R branch for the overtone. Then we have the P branch set of peaks, delta J minus ones. And then just like the fundamental Q branch is not observable, the overtone Q branch is also observable. So what we ask you to do is to try to determine B2 and D2. Technically, you can determine B0 and D0 again. The issue here is we've already determined them. And then this band is not as intense, so the transitions are a little bit more noisy, harder to pick out. So you're not going to get as precise a value for the uh, B0 and D0. So there's no point in repeating that analysis. Just remember, if we want to find B2 and D2, what we want to do is choose the transitions that start in the same energy level and then excite to different energy levels. So if we take the R1 minus the P1, for example, the R1 goes up to 2 starts in 1, the P1 starts in 1, goes up to only 0. So guess what? This works out to be equal to 6B2 minus 36D2. And as you guess it, R2 minus P2 ends at 10B2 minus 140D2. And hopefully you can show that to yourself if you're not sure. And then we can determine the overtone frequency, just like we did for the fundamental frequency, by taking the R0 plus the P1, and showing that that works out to be equal to the overtone frequency, plus 2B1 for the R0, and then we're gonna add, you know, add the, R, the P1 transition, which is the overtone frequency minus 2B0. So we get the same basic equations, except now we're talking about the overtone frequency. Now, the uh, overtone band is the one that has band centered around 5,600 wave numbers. So make sure to use the proper band to determine your B2 and D2 values. Sometimes people mistakenly determine B0 and D0 and think it's B2 and D2. Remember, our B0 is around 10.4, our B1 is around 10.1, and our B2 is going to end up probably around 9.8 or 9.9, .9, somewhere in that ballpark. So if you see your values coming closer to 10.4, you know, we probably have chosen the wrong system. So make sure you're doing the R1 minus the P1, the R2 minus the P2, etc. And so then from there, we can make a relationship between our overtone or our fundamental frequency and the harmonic and anharmonic frequency. So these are being calculated using an expression before that our vibrational energy would be equal to, or that our fundamental frequency would be equal to the vibrational energy in the V equals one level minus the vibrational energy in the V equals zero level. And we had this general expression that our energy is a function of the vibrational quantum number was equal to omega E V plus a half and then minus omega E X E V plus a half squared. So the way we would have you know, obtain the equation that looks like equation uh, 30 is by plugging in a 1 for V. So plugging in a 
1 for v here in both spots, and then subtracting, plugging in a 0 for v, and then doing some rearranging. So likewise, you just want to plug in a 2 for v, and then plug in a 0 for v, do the arithmetic, do some rearranging. Um, I'll give you some you know, a tip for what you should find, but this one should be 6. I'll let you work out what the omega e should be, but that should be 6. And so then once you determine the proper equation, then you have two equations to unknowns. You'll have your fundamental and overtone frequencies is already determined. And then two relationships are the two equations that relate them to omega e and omega e x e. And you can solve for those values and then you can compare it to their literature values and they should match pretty well. So, so far we should have determined v e and alpha e that you can look up on NIST and then omega e and omega e x e that you can also look up on NIST and compare. Um, and then lastly, we can, well, not lastly, but um, getting to this lastly, we can determine distortion constants. Um, so the distortion constant we calculate using equation 17. Just scroll back if you need it. It's just recalculated off of BE and omega E. Um, there's an equation that involves beta that I find doesn't work as well, so we just recommend using equation 16. Then you can calculate D capital E, the dissociation energy, um, using uh, equation 26, which is just, you know, the one that has a relationship with omega E and omega E X E. Remember, these values here will be in wave numbers. So your dissociation energy you calculate will just be in wave numbers. And you can use one of the conversions or the packet to go over to KJ's per mole. Bond lengths. So the connection of bond length is that your rotational constant is just related to the moment of inertia. You can look at the specific equation for the relationship. Solve for the moment of inertia for the moment of inertia. That's reduced mass times the bond length uh, squared. You can then solve for the bond length. So use the connection of the rotational constants to the moment of inertia, moment of inertia to the bond length to calculate the bond length. And then the final section is getting into isotope effects so that you can calculate the dependence of the mass of an isotope to where you expect to find the, um, the signal arising from that of that isotope so you can kind of compare where you expect to find the chlorine 37 um, frequency compared to the chlorine 35 frequency their reduced masses are pretty similar so that's not going to lead to a big change whereas if you had the deuterated version the deuterium chloride then it's going to be pretty far off so you can look at some isotope effects as we proceed this will go on to the next page but our next page is then showing us that we can work out kind of a um, a relationship of the uh, frequencies that we'll observe is just uh, a relationship of the square of the you know, inverse of their um, uh, reduced masses. So the frequency you expect to find for the chlorine 35 isotope compared to the 37 is just you know the chlorine 35 reduced mass divided into the chlorine 37 reduced mass square root of that. And this is just coming from the relationship of a frequency um, to the um, force constant and reduced mass. I've rearranged equation 36 to be like an earlier equation where we have the frequency as 1 over 2 pi k over the um, uh, reduced mass, but here we're just simply using the relationship of plugging in the actual value in wave numbers and coming up with this relationship. So the whole idea here is you can predict where you expect to find the R0 for the 1H37 chlorine to make sure um, and if you, we haven't talked about this in any of the videos that I can recall, but if you look at the signal of HCl um, that we were getting our data from, there's like little doublets all next to each other. And you can sort of verify that the 1H37 Cl peaks are right next to um, the 1H35 peaks. The 2H35 peaks, you can predict where those should arise. You can actually look them up in the deuterium chloride sample and kind of see how close we get. They're actually off a little bit, but that's probably just due to... Um, you know, how fine we're actually using the isotopic masses. So you actually want to look up the mass of 1H and 2H here to be accurate. And then um, likewise, you can sort of predict where you expect to find some of the overtone frequencies. And then from there, we're just wrapping up, making a table and writing a conclusion. Okay, so um, this last video here, if you made it this far, hopefully you know you paused along the way, did some calculations, and just used whatever you needed to out of this final video. All right, thanks for the attention.